Hey, what's going on everybody? Welcome back to another video. And today we are continuing the talk about ProRes, but there have been some major changes and some more findings that I wanna share with you since my last video, which by the way, thank you for all the love and support and welcome to a whole new group of you. So as the title and thumbnail suggests, today we're gonna to be talking about how the iPhone 13 Pro Max shooting in ProRes compares to a cinema camera shooting in ProRes, specifically my Pocket 6K Pro. And we are going to get to that in a few minutes, but first I wanted to talk about some updates from ProRes on the iPhone. Specifically yesterday, Apple actually released the new iOS 15.1 beta, which has ProRes built in to the stock camera app. In my previous video, it was only built into Filmic Pro due to their update, and now Apple is basically playing catch up with their own feature. Now, first of all, I know it's in beta, so this opinion may change, but for now, if the design that it's currently in goes to the public version, it's pretty bad. Like not only is there a typical lack of manual control, which we all kind of knew was going to happen, the actual settings you have are pretty redundant. On the left hand side of the screen when holding the phone horizontally, you can tap the ProRes button, which you have to be in 4K uh, 24 or 30 to go into. If you are in 60, it's going to say ProRes not supported. And so that will turn on ProRes, but then also you have this like pro button on the side where you also can turn on and off ProRes, but just now in kind of like a slider form. Now to me, this would be the perfect spot to have the slider control for what flavor of ProRes you want, whether it's proxy LT, 422, HQ, whatever, but at least currently that's not what it is. And then you also do have this exposure meter slider, which is like the closest we've ever gotten to more manual controls in the stock camera app. So you still can just tap on the screen and slide up and down to adjust exposure, or you can go on the meter and go basically plus or minus whatever stops you want. It does give you haptic feedback, which is kind of nice. And since you're actually getting some sort of metric of exposure adjustments on screen, it does give you a little bit more fine control. So when I compare it to the Pocket 6K Pro, I want to leave it in the stock camera app ProRes because I just wanna compare the two since I focused so much on the Filmic Pro app in the last video. But before I did that, I wanted to know which flavor of ProRes Apple was using in their stock camera app since it doesn't tell you straight up front. And again, this may change because it is in beta. So what I did is basically a simple, relatively scientific test where I just shot a couple sample clips where I used both the HEVC codec on the stock camera app, then switched to ProRes. And then I went to Filmic Pro, shot the same clip in all the different flavors of ProRes in the same uh, 4K24. So once I imported all the footage into the computer, more specifically DaVinci Resolve, I was able to just click on the clips and look at the metadata to see which flavor of ProRes the Apple stock camera was shooting in, and it looks like it is shooting in ProRes HQ. Sweet. But I know that may disappoint a lot of you who are looking to shoot in like ProRes 422, ProRes LT to save on space. Again, I hope by the final release that Apple at least somewhere in the settings gives you control over which one you're shooting in. But for now, at least you get ProRes HQ built in. We are in the age of computational photography. There is so much going on behind the scenes that these phones are doing to give you the best possible image, pretty much no matter what setting you're shooting in. It's not as easy then when we're comparing like this camera versus like a Canon R5 or something where the sensor and the lens are pretty much shooting at consistent bit rates and giving you a same look and there's no real post-processing going on um, past whatever codec you're shooting in. So it's very simple to be like, oh, this camera is really noisy at this ISO or this lens is really X, Y, and Z. Here, it seems like everybody who is shooting is getting semi-different results because the results I showed in my last video when specifically that one Peter McKinnon backpack shot on the beach, that is a huge, huge difference from that HEVC to ProRes shot. And that wasn't a lie. I didn't like pixelate you know, the left uh, image to make the ProRes look better. When I look at the results that I just shot on this table under the studio light and I go from HEVC to ProRes HQ, 422, LT, and Proxy all side by side, look for yourself. 
I have never pixel peeped more to find the difference. And I purposely did the starkest difference up front. I did HEVC directly to ProRes HQ. And if you look, there is technically a difference and that is the ProRes does have cleaner noise or at least it's less smooth because the HEVC is kind of trying to add a little bit more noise reduction and ProRes has just always been better at cleaner noise. And so the little bit more and cleaner noise does make the edges look a tad sharper, but it is not the same difference in quality that we saw in that backpack sample clip. And even more so going down to 422LT and proxy, you're getting nearly identical results. So what this means is actually a good thing that a lot of people kind of predicted, and that is if you want the cleaner noise, then shoot in ProRes LT or ProRes proxy, and you won't get the absolute insane file sizes they're still gonna be bigger than the HEVC codec. Honestly, the biggest differences between these clips has nothing to do with the codec or the sharpness at all. If you noticed, the actual biggest change is when I went from the stock camera app to Filmic Pro. And you may have noticed that it almost looked like there was a focal length difference and I didn't move the phone at all. The difference is in the Filmic Pro app, I turn image stabilization off. And it's just kind of interesting as you can actually see how much of a crop you get when you turn image stabilization on, but also you're at a totally different color profile. The stock camera app is shooting Dolby Vision which I did properly convert this time uh, so that it looks more, you know, realistic. And in the Filmic Pro app, as I've said before, their cinematography kit does not currently work with ProRes, so there is no log conversion going on. This is just their standard color profile. However, both files are 10 bit. I, for one, prefer the look that I'm getting out of the Filmic Pro, but that's just because I can control things manually, like white balance, ISO, and shutter. I'm sure that I can match the Dolby Vision clip to look how I want it but that would take just more work. So I know that it's taken a little bit of time to get to the actual main point of this video, but I thought that was all really important information to update you with on my findings because I always want to be transparent and honest. And, you know, I'm not some fanboy for Filmic, for Apple, for anything. I'm a super fanboy for getting really cool images out of all sorts of cameras. And so, so far what I've learned is that ProRes definitely has its benefits just like anything else. It seems like if you are just shooting some home movies of, you know, your kids, family, friends, whatever, sticking to the regular HEVC codec is going to do a lot for you as Apple has put a ton of R&D into making that codec as efficient as humanly possible while still giving you a great image. However, if you're on some more professional set and you happen to switch between ProRes and HEVC while you're on set just to do a quick test, you may find that ProRes gives you a lot of benefits. And so in that case, it's very nice to have the option to turn that on. So now let's finally talk about the Blackmagic Pocket 6K Pro versus the iPhone 13 Pro Max. Normally on the Pocket 6K Pro, I only shoot B-RAW to give me that raw control in post, but for today's battle, I am going to stick it into ProRes HQ as well as the ProRes HQ on the iPhone. Now the purpose of this battle is to kind of add to the conversation about how far away phone cameras are from actual real dedicated cameras. I don't even know what to call them. It's a, it's a real camera. I know it sounds weird. And so I wanna put them both through a series of tests that's going to push them to kind of match each other. Now, before we get to the test footage and the final results, I'm curious, leave a comment down below with kind of your guess as to not which one's gonna be better. I think we all know that one, but just kind of your guess as to how close uh, they'll actually be, especially if you've been around this channel a long time and you remember last year I did a Pocket 6K Pro versus the iPhone 12 Pro Max, and some of you were quite fooled. So it'll be interesting to see how much closer they've gotten a year later. Let's get to it. And I'm back, well, on the computer this time because I 
have brought in to resolve all the sample footage that you just got teased a little bit. Make sure to comment down below what you think, which camera is which. Some of them were dead giveaways, others were a little bit closer. All right, so the big reveal is camera A is the iPhone 13 Pro Max and camera B is the Blackmagic Pocket 6K Pro. So everything you see here on the top line of the timeline is iPhone and the bottom is the Blackmagic. I just want to kind of go through them and kind of point out where the differences are in these cameras and how close phones have really come. Because especially like this first one, I was genuinely shocked. Obviously, we still have differences in like color temperature. Um, I want to point out what I did to the footage because it was basically nothing. So if I go over to the color page here, um, the black magic footage I didn't touch at all. Um, so this is just the ProRes HQ out of the camera. Um, so whatever white balance I chose for each shot, which I didn't change it too much. I think it was around 5,100K. Um, that is pretty much where it stayed at. Now for the iPhone footage, I had to do some things just because it's Dolby Vision. And so it looks like this straight out of the camera. And as you can see, I only applied one node. Uh, I'm using Cinematch, which is fantastic. I'll link them in the description down below. Um, really, really cool plugin for Resolve. Uh, and I think maybe Final Cut or Premiere. I don't know. I only use it in Resolve. But basically, you can just choose a camera source and a target camera. It allows you to match things closer. So uh, technically, I could go in and choose my target profile and change that to like the Blackmagic camera if I was trying to really match the two, um, could do that. But I just basically set them both to Pro Max. Now, the only thing I played around with, if you have Cinematch yourself, um, is for the target profile, I chose Limited for Dolby instead of Full. Full added a lot more contrast and it was really crushing the blacks. Um, so I did limited on the target, but then full on the source. And that seemed to be a nice balance. And then I just basically played with the built-in exposure controls over here. Didn't really touch too much, um, in my actual primaries. And I basically did that for every clip. And the only adjustments I made per clip was the, um, the amount of exposure control, but that's pretty much it. In terms of color, I didn't add LUTs or grade or anything. So again, going back to this first clip, ignoring the white balance difference, um, which the iPhone obviously has it better. I didn't really change it from daylight balance, so that's why it's warmer here. You're going to see a consistent thing in pretty much in all of these clips, and that is Blackmagic looks softer. Not that it's less sharp, but it just has this like softer feel, and that is just going to come from pure, as a lot of people have been saying in videos about ProRes, physics. In my opinion, what Apple has done with ProRes on the iPhone, we have reached the limit of, okay, this is really high bitrate stuff. They have very good color science. It's straight up Dolby Vision. But now we just need to keep getting bigger sensors and bigger optics in there because here we're seeing the characteristics of the Blackmagic sensor and the irix lens if i would have put a sigma art series lens this would look slightly different so obviously this looks really good but the iphone one really surprised me because we are getting larger sensors each year we are getting more of a fall off i mean if you took a camera phone from five years ago you wouldn't have you know this fall off and obviously shooting stuff like cinematic mode that's gonna have that artificial blur but all this blur you see back here um, this is all very true. This is just natural blur and bokeh that's happening from the uh, slightly larger lens and sensor. I also purposely kept the softbox kind of in the shot because I wanted to see how bad it would clip. And it really doesn't look ugly on either one. All the text on the lens looks incredibly sharp on both. And even the noise, as I've been saying, ProRes has excellent noise handling um, it, it just looks great in here. And even if I zoom in, let's go, what have I been doing? Like 2.6 times. We can see that this looks still very clean. If I go back and forth between these, you know, what's funny is the, uh, 
the iPhone has cleaner noise. You notice here how there's a lot of chroma noise. And again, I could apply denoiser um, and remove some of that chroma noise. But yeah, the iPhone one is cleaner, pretty much just as sharp. Again, the fall off and like the shading, this is, I mean, the black magic is 12 bit color. So it's going to retain, it's going to have less harsh gradients between each of the colors. That looks darn good if you ask me. Now, moving on to the portrait one, I was also very happy about this, uh, except for on the Black Magic. Obviously, Black Magics don't have flip out screens, and I didn't put a front monitor on, so I kind of just set it to a foot and a half and then kind of guessed. And my beard is perfectly in focus, but I missed my eyes. Don't judge this clip by the sharpness of my eyes, but obviously, the iPhone is crazy sharp. This was like, it was kind of mind blowing to me how sharp this looked. In my opinion, it definitely kind of crosses over to that overly sharpened look. So I definitely would apply a little bit of softener even, which I like never do. I mean, I like how sharp the hair looks in my eyes, um, but the skin itself is just too harsh. So I would probably use uh, Resolve's facial softener thing, which will leave the hair and the eyes and lips and stuff, but then soften the skin ever so slightly. But again, we're seeing kind of a dynamic range difference here. Because again, I didn't change the lighting at all. Um, this was filmed in the same exact moments. Again, neither of them are color corrected to match. But here we can see all those like specular highlights on my nose and beginning up here that is very close to clipping. Uh, it's kind of just under that. And I lowered the exposure on this quite a bit. Whereas on here, you do get a little bit of that specular highlight on my nose, but everywhere else looks really solid and flat. And that's purely just because this camera has better dynamic range. And I may steamroll through some of these clips just because some of them are more important than others. I wasn't sure, but based on seeing these clips, I believe that even with ProRes, you're still using HDR4 on the iPhone because as you can see here, the window is still retaining some information from the outside where it's pretty much all completely blown and we even lose the window. Yeah, the window wasn't super in it, but here you at least pretty much retain the entire uh, window frame. For here, you start to even lose the frame itself is gone. Everywhere else looks pretty similar. Again, white balance, totally different. I. I should have paid attention more to that so it would look somewhat more similar. And then this is just auto white balance. We can see on my dog here that her back is quite clipped. Where if we go on here, everything is perfectly retained. Again, dynamic range. This is why Hollywood cameras for so long stayed at around like 3K or even 2K um, when they shot. But they would have ridiculous like 15, 16, 17 stops of dynamic range. That is in my opinion looks way more cinematic than a specific resolution uh this shot again i feel like the iphone it's it's all sharp um i wasn't able to match it like i wasn't able to go down to like you know t22 in here because i didn't set up any studio lights it's all just natural lighting um and so i think this was like t4 maybe five six and so we can see that I believe the couch is what I focused on um, or maybe even the cabinets because everything else like things that are closer and things that are further are just a little softer. Whereas here like this is crazy sharp. This is crazy sharp. Couch is crazy sharp. That's crazy sharp. Like this is basically bumping up the ISO and then it's a really small sensor and then it's closing it down to whatever f-stop it wants. But this is one of the reasons that uh, iPhones really can be great for real estate videos if you want everything to look in focus. This one I actually thought was a bit closer. Again, similar to my portrait one here, I was happily surprised at the amount of natural bokeh and, and just blurred background. This is not cinematic mode. This is the iPhone probably six, seven inches away from my daughter's face. And so all this background here is perfectly natural and it looks great. And she's actually in the shadow. And so it's not very well lit. Um, we are seeing some denoiser going on here, which is, I think, why this one still looks a bit sharper when we find a spot that's sharp. Again, the white balance is all kind of wonky. Um, 
but we could go in and, you know, correct all that to match it more if we wanted to. Again, obviously I'm still going to give it to the cinema camera as I do with pretty much all of these. Um, but this, this I think looks great for a phone. <laughs> this looks awesome. All right, another moving one. We start at the top. We can see that the top window is blown out. Bottom one, we got some information, still some clipped components. Uh, colors are looking decent. And then we get into here, it goes full HDR. So here we can see it's still clipped, lack of dynamic range, but then it really starts to kind of figure out, okay, there's a lot of window here, so it needs to go kind of full HDR to the outside. And we're still very well exposed on the inside here. Um, and so that looks nice. Same shot with this, um, but the exterior is more blown out than the iPhones was. Again, shaky cam, all handheld. Um, this definitely looks more like cinematic and grungy. Again, just it feels like there's more depth, and that's what the larger sensor kind of gives you, in my opinion. Um, is it just it? I can feel the depth of the room in this shot compared to this just looks more flat, if that makes sense. And when we go out here, whew, this is where the iPhone definitely takes the cake um, because yeah, we pretty much lose the majority of the information out of the windows. And might I say, this was a very overcast day. So if this was like a super bright sunny day, this would have been even worse. Uh, this one I thought was pretty close to be honest, again, different vibes, different colors. Um, but I, I feel like I could spend time, like if I wanted this kind of grungy, more green, yellow look to it, I feel like I could really do that with this shot. The reason that I think it does so well and matches so well is if I look at the start of both of these, you can see the exterior window is still pretty well kept in both of them. A little clip on the top part of the window on both but it keeps the information. We have a nice blurred, not only deep background, but actually relatively close to the subject. We can see our focus is on the Nest uh, logo, same here. And so same amount of blur as we come around. If the phone or, or the camera were on a gimbal and you, know, you really spend some time, maybe you lit the shot um, or flagged it off so you didn't get these ugly reflections, you could match these shot up really well. Like I really believe you could color grade this and match this in if you needed like a quick insert for a shot to cut away for two seconds or something. But yeah, all in all, we need bigger sensors in smartphones. And I actually asked this to Tyler Stallman in a podcast. He had me on his podcast uh, yesterday. It's actually just went live today. Um, you guys should check it out. I'll leave it down below. But, and I asked him, would you rather have smartphone cameras be the relative size that they are now, you know, not taking up too much space, not adding too much thickness to the phone, maybe a little larger, or would you rather have what like Motorola tried years ago with like some attachment on the back or like the red hydrogen, like a crazy, like big, thick uh, camera, if it could give you like at least like a true micro four thirds sensor size for the uh, phone. That would be pretty crazy. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments below. How do you think these two cameras uh, kind of went ahead? Do you agree with me? Dynamic range, sensor size, that is pretty much all the iPhone is missing at this point. Everything else, the color science, it's 10-bit. Um, the Dolby Vision obviously is great. Now we have ProRes, so we have true professional grade bit rate amounts. I mean, it's got everything. Um, except the dynamic range and the larger optics and sensor. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to get subscribed, and I'll see you in the next video.